good news, good news, always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. No matter what else is happening in the world, always good news, good news, there is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for Good News Today. Thanks so much for joining us. Let me tell you what's coming up on this edition of GNT. We'll begin, as always, with our devotional time, scripture reading, beautiful singing, and then a brief study of our scripture. And we go to the Old Testament, to the Psalms today, for a brief but beautiful psalm, Psalm 133, just three verses. But we'll deal with a very important subject derived from these three verses, and that subject is unity and how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Thanks so much for being with us. Let's read these three very poignant verses that comprise Psalm 133, a psalm attributed to David. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. We're back for the study portion of our devotional time, looking at the beautiful 133rd Psalm. Just three verses, but oh how important they are because they deal with such a vital subject, the subject of unity. As we mentioned a moment ago, this this Psalm is attributed uh, to David, and it is thought to have uh, been uh, written upon the occasion of David's being crowned king at Hebron. You remember that uh, Saul, of course, was the first king of the United Kingdom of Israel, and you recall how jealous he became of David, sought to kill him, and at the end of all of that conflict, ultimately at Hebron, uh, the tribes united to come together to, uh, to crown David as the king. And it is believed that it was that occasion that prompted these inspired words, because there was unity there. Uh, They were united, finally, after so much time spent in conflict and hostility. And uh, so now 
they are united. But there's so much for us to glean from this beautiful psalm about the unity that is so important today in the Christian dispensation. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And he uses, he uses two illustrations here. The first illustration is uh, regarding Aaron and the anointing of Aaron as the uh, high priest when the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood was established, the law of Moses being uh, instituted. And again, that was another occasion of, of joy, of joy and uh, uh, an occasion for rejoicing over the, the unity that was uh, present at the time that Aaron was anointed, he and his sons, and the priesthood was established and so forth there. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. In other words, uh, over his entire uh, body, uh, this precious, fragrant uh, uh, ointment. And of course, anointing was something that was uh, common in the Old Testament period as kings were anointed. And in this case, as God had instructed Moses to do, Aaron was anointed. But it was a complete uh, anointing, not just a a sprinkling of, uh, of this beautiful, precious, uh, fragrant ointment, but over the entire body and um, representing perhaps the unity that is to be uh, pervasive and complete, that we are to be completely united and how pleasant it is when brethren are united. Now, the second illustration that the psalmist uses is the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. He brings Zion in here uh, because of course Zion was where the Lord as the last part of this uh, psalm verse 3 tells us there the Lord commanded the blessing life evermore and of course Zion uh, speaking of the place where the temple was God's presence there in Jerusalem in the temple but ultimately of course spiritual Zion is the church. And for the last few minutes that we have in our devotional time, I'd like for us to think about the, the spiritual Zion and some application of this beautiful psalm about unity to the unity that is so important to God, so important to Christ, the unity for which Christ so fervently prayed in his very last hours uh, on this earth. Let me take you to a passage that we've looked at in, in times past, John 17. That's the Lord's Prayer, truly the prayer that, that the Lord himself prayed. But after he prayed for himself to have the glory restored that he had known with the Father before he came to this earth, and then in the second part of this beautiful prayer, he prays for, prays for his apostles, for the apostles themselves, and then he turns his attention to believers for all time, where in verse 20, he prays, I do not pray for these, that is the apostles, alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all, listen to that, that they all may be one. But now listen to this, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, notice the basis for the unity for which Christ prayed. He prayed that they all, believers for all time to come, that they all may be one, but notice, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. In other words, as God and Christ are one, Christ prayed that believers for all time would be one. Well, would that mean that we should be one in our doctrine, in what we believe and practice in our religion? Well, of course it does, because God and Christ are one in doctrine. When Jesus came to this earth, on more than one occasion, he stated that he came to do the will of the Father, and that he always did the will of the Father. In John chapter 10 and verse 30, he made a very succinct and powerful statement about unity. I and the Father, he said, are one. Not one, per not one person, there are three persons in the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But he was saying, I and the Father are one. One, meaning we are completely united and united in teaching. I did not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, Jesus said. Now then, if Christ prayed for that same kind of unity for believers for all time, how can we justify 
all of the religious division that exists in our world today and claim that it is pleasing to God. It cannot be. The only thing that can please God is the kind of unity that is based upon the truth. That is the truth of the New Testament, the last will and testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In a previous program, we looked at a passage in our devotional time in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, and uh, beginning there at uh, verse 1. Let's read some of these verses. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Now listen to this. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. When we talked about these verses in a previous program, we talked about the unity of the Spirit being the unity that comes from obeying the teaching of the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit in the New Testament, through the New Testament, has revealed to us all of God's will for us in this Christian age, the final age of time. Therefore, the unity of the Spirit has to be a unity based upon the teaching of the Spirit. So, can we wear different names and teach different doctrines about vitally important subjects like salvation and still claim to be all united? No, unity on that basis, agreeing to disagree, is not biblical unity. You've probably heard the old expression that you can tie two cat's tails together and throw them across a clothesline, and you may have union, but you don't have unity. I guarantee you don't. And so you can't have biblical unity by calling it agreeing to disagree type unity. That's not the unity for which Christ prayed. That's not the unity about which the psalmist wrote here. And so we are to be united doctrinally. Now, in that passage we looked at in the previous program, those great seven ones are then uh, depicted for us by Paul. There is one body, that's the church, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one faith, that's one system of faith, one system of doctrine, one baptism, that's baptism in water for the remission of sins, the only baptism that existed at the time that uh, Paul penned these words. And then he adds, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. If we believe there is one God, and we should, then why would we why would we contend that there are many religious bodies that can be pleasing to God? Since the same text says there's one body. And the Ephesian epistle makes it clear that the body is the church. But it's not a denomination among denominations. It's, it's in, uh, among denominations. It's not one denomination better than another. It is the pre-denominational church about which we can read in the New Testament, the pattern for which is clearly set forth, and the pattern that we must follow.